Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I actually have, I was born in an EEB department, so it's really nice to be in this kind of culture. I'm now in molecular computational biology department. We have a different culture. That's fine. So um, uh, I want to talk to you today about um, our, our efforts to kind of dissect the genetic basis of penis bone size and shape. And just to start right off, because probably some of you at least don't know this, but a lot of mammals have a bone in their penis. Not all of them, not humans. Chimpanzees do. It's variable. It blinks on and off during evolution. It's very fascinating. This is what I'm talking about. This is actually, I brought some props. So this is actually a raccoon's vacuum. Um, this is a fascinating structure. A raccoon without its tail is maybe, I don't know, that long, right? So this is a significant piece of equipment that a male raccoon is walking around with. Why is it curved this way? Um, we have no idea. Why does it evolve so rapidly? Something I'm going to going to show you in a second. We have no idea. But this is a fundamental pattern in evolutionary biology. For hundreds of years, um, by the way, this is a 3D, 3D printed, highly imperfect mouse baculum, which will be the topic of today's um, talk mostly. We calculated that this mouse would be 42 feet long. <laughs> <laughs> but, but most of that is its tail, OK? So, so anyhow, you can come up and look at this. This is all very fun. And, um, OK. For hundreds of years, mammologists have studied this, this structure. Um, but this is how they've sort of studied it. Okay? They took a length on it. They took a depth. Maybe they took a width, or maybe they took a volume. But this is it, right? This is the, the extent of the sort of um, methods development and baculum evolution. Okay? If I took away the baculum and I gave you those dimensions, you would think it looked like this, right? It doesn't look like this. We lose a massive amount of information when we go from this complex curved structure to these summary statistics. So a lot of what I'm going to talk to you about today um, is, is a lot of methods development, sort of relax that constraint of, of measuring. And right off the bat, I'm just going to tell you, it's very difficult to study these structures. There's no landmarks on them. We can't really assign homology across different species. Um, part of that's because they vary so much. But this here should horrify everybody in the room. And that's because University of Michigan is actually the, the place where this sort of second revolution of morphometrics was born. These are affectionately referred to as the blue book, the red book, the green book, and the orange book. Fred Bookstein was here at Michigan. Um, this is, I think he was in like the center of human growth or something. Is that even a department anymore? I don't know. This is a 25th anniversary of this book, the blue book, right? So these guys were coming up, they were applying engineering principles to study biological objects using engineering principles, OK? But we needed landmarks for the most part. So we needed to know where that fin connected, right? And we would call that homologous across different fish. OK, so what we want to do is we want to study the structure as it is. We don't want to summarize it. And just a quick backdrop. So I'm really interested in, the, in this general question of what genes affect male reproduction. So there's all these stages that males have to perform in. <clears throat> and we can look at the antlers of a deer, and it kind of makes sense. Okay, So a deer with big antlers is going to be able to beat up the other males better. And he also might appear more attractive to females. And those might not be mutually exclusive. That same principle applies to features of genitalia. This is a mouse in its placenta. It turns out um, there's a lot of deer antlers and placenta going on. It, it applies to gamete evolution. It applies to reproductive protein evolution. So let's look at that a little bit further. So um, it's probably safe to say that, on average, male genitalia are the fastest evolving structure of any morphology, period. Nothing comes even close. So here's a smattering of primate penises. Here's a smattering of primates. I could give you you know, trading cards with primate faces. And I could ask you to classify them. And you guys would be pretty decent, even if you're not primatologists. Okay? You could look for similarities, morphological similarities. And you wouldn't be that wrong in your systematics. If I gave you trading cards of primate penises, you would have no idea who is related to who. And the reason for that is they evolve off the charts. We have no idea why. Okay? We have some ideas why. I shouldn't say no idea. But we, um, we, it's this, just this fundamental pattern in evolutionary biology that demands explanation, and it's really hard to study. Okay? 
Recently, we published a paper on whale pelvic bone evolution. It turns, turns out you see a lot of similar patterns in the pelvic bones. This is internal anatomy that serves as an anchor for muscles that control the penis. So it's not the penis, it's muscles that control the penis. And we uncovered some very interesting patterns of rapid evolution in the evolution of this internal infrastructure that supports the genitals. If we look at sperm, here's the same concept, okay? So these are all just sperm heads, their tails have been chopped off. These are all from one genus of rodent that only lives in Australia. Okay, this is insane. What is all this variation doing? Again, I could give you playing cards, trading cards with mice, and you would be not terrible systematists. But if I gave you trading cards of sperm, you would have no idea how to group them. And you'd often be wrong. So we have, we have some sperm that have no hooks. We have some with three hooks. We have some with one hook. This is nuts, right? Same principle applies to reproductive protein evolution. This is not something I'm going to talk about today. But some reproductive proteins evolve off the charts, OK? So we're putting all this together, and I'm telling you that these are fundamental patterns of evolution, and we ha they demand explanation. We have to understand them. So let's crank down now and talk about bacula. These are all real illustrations of real biological structures. These are all real bacula in real living organisms. This is insane, right? These are in the penises of all of these different mammals. Which one's your favorite? <laughs> Seriously. Pitchfork? OK. Pitchfork's awesome, right? This is a Rhizomys. This is a, I um, uh, can't remember the, the common name of it. So the, these are crazy. What is this thing doing? What is that? OK. This is the raccoon. These are not drawn to scale, by the way. This is the raccoon, so this is not as big as what I just showed you. They are all pointed so that the anterior is to the left. And then some are dorsal and some are lateral. What is that all about? Why is it two-pronged, right? That's Aplodontia. That's a mountain beaver, a very basal rodent. So I just want to make a couple of points here. The diversity is huge. By the way, um, Priscilla, we were looking at that one up there today in your collections. That's a Cyrus. That's a squirrel. Um, OK, so I just want to make a couple points. A, the diversity is crazy. I think you believe me. I can advance a slide, right? But B. All of these structures enter the female during copulation. These are not just support accessory structures at the base of the penis. Most of these are occurring towards the tip of the penis. They are interacting with the female's environment. Okay? We kind of think that um, they affect fertilization success. The evidence is um, uh, it's slight, so we'll get to that in a second. Okay, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to focus on the mouse as a, as a model system. So this is a mouse's penis. Again, anterior is to the left. And this is a lateral view. And there's a baculum that's, um, there's a bone in there. And this, I just outlined it in, in white. So this is like the urethra. That's where the mouse you know, transfers sperm and also peas. Um, and so this is this structure. This is this structure sitting in a mouse's penis. Okay. Um, and just to let you know, that baculum shape matters. I'm just going to show you a couple of different studies that were done in totally independent labs with totally independent genetic systems, both in mice, but totally different. And they found a very, very similar result. And we have, I'll just ruin the punchline, we have no idea why they found this result, but it's the result. Study number one, <clears throat> baculum morphology predicts reproductive success of male house mice under sexual selection. So in a nutshell, what these authors did is they let mice run around in a, a, in a semi-natural enclosure. And they genotyped all the babies that came out of it. And they phenotyped all the parents that could have been. And they assigned parentage. OK. <clears throat> How about I turn that off? Um, OK, and what they found was that the width, but not the length, of the house mouse baculum predicts both the mean number of offspring sired per litter and the total number of offspring sired. So if you're a male house mice and you're out there competing with other males, females multiply mate all the time, by the way, if you have a wide baculum, you will get more offspring. This is evolutionary fitness. This is a pretty important phenotype. Totally different study. 
experimental evidence for the evolution of the mammalian baculum by sexual selection. These authors did a couple of different things, one of which included um, experimental evolution and one of which included natural populations where the level of multiple mating varied. Again, so blah, 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 27 generations of experimental evolutions, population of mice subjected to a lot of multiple mating, evolved bacula that were relatively thicker than populations subjected to enforced monogamy. Same exact pattern. So they, they are talking about this dimension. They're talking about the width of the baculum. Okay? So one of those papers only studied length and width and was able to uh, uncover that pattern. And one of those studies placed landmarks around the, the bone and was able to uncover the, that study, but it also not in three dimensions. Okay. So to boil it down to two questions um, specific for today. So first, can we study bacula in three dimensions? Okay, so this is largely methods development, but it's very important, and so I, I want to talk to you about it. Um, this, by the way, the, some of the solutions that we came up with can be applied to anything you guys might be interested in studying. In fact, they were developed for that whale paper I told you. Okay. Second, and this is the very important, uh, um, this is a very important goal. So what is the genetic basis of baculum size and shape variation? If we can understand the genetics of it, which at the moment we have no idea what genes underlie variants in baculum, if at all, then we can understand how to manipulate the structure. And we can actually design really powerful functional experiments. So my big dream pie in the sky thing, which will probably fail, but it'll fail 10 years from now, okay, is that we want to like knock out or knock in or knock up or do something to developing mouse penis so that we can give it a squirrel's baculum, okay? Or we can make a lack of we can make it lack a baculum. We can ask very powerful directed functional questions about this structure. Okay. So let's handle this first case, for, um, this first question first. So these are very small structures, okay? So what we do is we pack them all in a micro CT scanner. So they get bombarded with x-rays. These are all different bacula with some home-brewed software we wrote where we can segment out from these micro CT scans, which is just like hundreds of sli image slices, right? We can plot, pile them all together and we can rip them out of that um, image. And so I'm just showing you one here, and this is the real important point. So I can take this image, which I don't even know what format it's in. It's like a TIFF or something. And I can convert it to uh, about 100,000 XYZ points. So what you're looking at here is a cloud of points. Okay, So each thing has XYZ coordinates. And you can see a couple of things. So first of all, you know these are packed in sort of what I call Mickey Mouse coordinates. Right? So some are pointing down and, and left and up and straight and whatever. And that's to give us some redundancy so that we know that that's really the right specimen and we didn't like invert the image somehow. And so this first step is we have to get these all aligned. Because again, we're going to be comparing bones, right? We can't, we can't compare this bone to this bone as they are because they're not even in the same, they're not even in the same alignment. So you can see, I'm not going to really get into this, but you can see you know, this is a straight up and down bone. And we'll call that the z-axis, and this the x-axis, and the thing coming out the y-axis. OK. So let's, um, let's look at two bacula. So here are two bacula. They're separated by a dotted line. This is just a lateral and a dorsal view, a lateral and a dorsal view. When we started this project, we had no idea how much variation we would see. Again, this is all within the lab mouse. So this is a single species of mice. What do you think? Do these two bacula differ from each other? How do they differ? Heavy on the bottom. Okay, heavy on the bottom. This, I love that. I call this teardroppy shape. I like heavy on the bottom better. What else? Curvature, Curvature right? I call that curviness. We're pretty close there. Okay. These are really stupid words, right? I mean, you know, <laughs> we should be able to quantify this better than like, well, it's, you know, teardroppy and curvy and all this, right? Okay, so this was very, very encouraging. Because if we didn't see variation in the first place, we would have just stopped the project more, 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 than, more than likely. OK, so a slightly busier image now. I'm just going to explain to you how we quantify those silly words, like, like uh, teardroppy and curvy. So um, this didn't come out too, too great, I'm seeing now. Um, but there's a, you can see there's a back, lat, lateral and dorsal baculum, right? Now there's all these red square, red rectangles that are drawn around it. These rectangles allow us 
to measure the width and the depth of the baculum at you know, 50 evenly spaced slices along this. It's all computational at this point. There's also a big rectangle that runs the length of that thing. We, f we felt that that would capture curviness in some, in some way, which isn't totally defined at the moment, which, w w but we'll get into it. Just to give you a little bit better idea, so I just pulled out this one slice of points, okay? So, and then we're just turn I just turned it, so we're like looking down the center of the bone. That's awesome, isn't it? Like, I, didn't, I don't know how many people know, now a bunch do, that the inside of a mouse's baculum is hollow, right? That's awesome. I mean, it's just like any other bone, I guess, but still. So all, you see all these x, y, z points, um, and, and what we can do is we can calculate something called the minimum bounding rectangle. It's just the smallest rectangle that contains all those points. And that's it. So that's that rectangle. It's nothing too complicated. I didn't invent anything except I just applied you know, already established uh, techniques. This is all about high school geometry so far. OK. I want to make two very important points right here, which is we, there's a big difference between size and shape. OK, so I can take this, this rectangle and I can compute a length in pixels. And we know how pixels relate to microns and et cetera, et cetera. I can calculate a length and a width. A length and a width is a size measurement. I could, for example, take all the areas of these rectangles, multiply them by the interrectangle distance, and that's a rough, imperfect proxy for what we might call volume. Okay? That's a size measurement. If instead I take the length divided by the width, I now have a ratio for this rectangle, right? And I've completely removed size. So I'm now studying shape just simply by dividing those two and getting a ratio. OK. So just to give you an idea of kind of um, how the analysis works. So we've got a bunch of specimens here. And in this case, I'm showing you ratios. So this is like the ratio of rectangle 1 or the vertical rectangle, rectangle 1, rectangle 2. So there's an inherent problem at the outset, which is that all these rectangles are correlated with each other, right? So I'm pretty sure I don't have to explain what principal components analysis are. Is? Do I? Should I go? Good. Excellent. So we just convert them into principal components. Okay? So principal components um, d has two desirable features. One, it removes the correlation between all of those uh, rectangles because it basically invents a new space. And um, two is it really reduces the dimensionality of the data. So, you know, it with this data set, there are 50 rectangles here, and there's 51st going up there, that way. This is a 51-dimensional space. That's how we have to think about this. Once we convert to principal components, we get it down to like six dimensions or something like that. And really, only the first few are important. OK, any questions about that? Because the next one's going to be like a Christmas tree. OK, here's our Christmas tree. So those are the same rectangles. What I've done is I've color coded them according to their loadings onto PC1. Okay? So PC1 in a PC analysis is this new dimension that just max that explains the most variance in your original data. It's totally blind to your sample IDs. It just takes as input your entire data set. By definition, any rectangle that loads highly onto PC1 those are the rectangles that show the most variance in my data set. Okay? Look at where the rectangles are. So we said, what did you say? Heavy, heaviness? Heavy on the bottom, right? That's all these red rectangles right here. This is, this is not the heavy on the bottom one, but um, so I'm just plotting them on a single baculum. But if you imagine that other heavy on the bottom one, that change in trajectory is happening right about here. Okay? Curviness. Curviness is this big red, this big vertical rectangle, right? So we've basically now found out a way to quantify these silly words of heavy on the bottom and curviness, right? We know a piece, we have a PC1 score right now. And when I saw this, this was really encouraging because you sort of hate when your methods give you a different answer than what your eyes see. Your eyes are kind of like always the best statistical test. And my eyes saw that, just like your eyes saw that. And, and this method sees that too. OK. So that's, um, 
kind of the end of, of this methods development part. I've left out a lot of details. Really, it took you know four years or something to develop this stuff because that whale paper just took forever. Um, but it was it was fun. So can we study bacula in three dimension? Yeah. So we developed some landmark free. I, I think I forgot to stress that, which is these bones don't have landmarks and it doesn't matter. So we're just moving in very precise locations up the length of the bone. And so we would call these sort of landmark free methods. We're not requiring some suture or you know, duct on the bone that we can digitize. We're just digitizing the whole thing. OK, and then, um, well, I'm skipping ahead of myself a little bit. But we observed, how about we leave out heritable for a second? We just observed variation. Okay, so these are our bones that vary within, within a species. Now, to test if it's heritable, I'm going to tell you another method that we employed. So one of the benefits of working in mice is there's uber resources out there. Genomics, expression data set, sets, crosses, strains, knockout mice. And we can kind of tap into all of that. I'm going to describe to you a little bit about what a recombinant inbred line panel is. Um, this slide, when I'm at towards the end, basically took 40 years or 30 years for people to construct. I was not involved in the process, but I can parasitize that effort. So this is incredibly valuable. So we start with a blue mouse and a red mouse, okay? And we make an F1. This F1, and those are its chromosomes, by the way, just represented by one uh, pair of autosomes. Okay, so this F1 is heterozygous everywhere. I can now take F1s and I can inbreed them independently. So I take a, a boy and a girl F1 and I put them in that cage and they inbreed brother-sister mating for 20 generations. I do that again and again and again and again and again. These F1s have recombination. Well, they all have recombination. The problem is if you're totally inbred, recombination doesn't produce anything new. Okay? But, so, so by the way, the red and the blue mouse are totally inbred. They're 100% homozygous. They're different from each other, but they're all uh, like identical twins. OK, so these recomb recombination here will matter. I will break up red and, and uh, blue chromosomes. And here I've just skipped forward about 20 generations. And I've made my recombinant inbred line 1. And depending on the vagaries of recombination, this might have a little blue here, red, blue, red. It's got, on average, 50% red and 50% blue. That's great. I can do this again and again and again and again. I can make 100 of these, OK? They all have 50% red and 50% blue on average, but it's a different 50% red and a 50% blue. So the goal here from, from now on is simply to look for the, um, the uh, correlation between phenotypic variants, like the baculum variants that I showed you, and the genetic variants. So for example, if this little, every time I got a recombinant in red line that had a little blue here, so like this guy, no, no, yes, yes, maybe those blue, when every, you get a blue chunk of chromosome there, you have a very curvy baculum, then that would tell me that, that some gene that's influencing curve, uh, baculum shape is, is in that region. OK? So it's all quantitative genetics and from, from here on out. Now, the two bacula that we were comparing side by side. One was, the curvy one was from this red guy, and the not curvy one was from that blue guy. Okay? So at this stage in the game, I only knew that the two parents varied. Again, if I didn't see any variants there, probably would have closed the book on this, on this project. I'm going to start filling in the rest of this. I'm going to start telling you about how, how we incorporated more and more recombinant inbred lines. And every time we add a line, we gain power. And we're still, everything I'm about to tell you is still severely underpowered. We've done the simulations. We still find some hits. That's very exciting. There are probably still many more to find. OK. Just real quick, without getting too much into methods, I'm just going to describe. So we summarized the variance in those principal components with uh, like what you might call a similarity tree. So we just made a big correlation matrix or a big distance matrix between their PCs, and we just built a tree out of it, OK? Just to kind of get an idea of, of what's going on. There's a lot on this slide, I'm, but there very, there's some very important key points here. OK, so first of all, our, our red parent is shown in red, OK? Our blue parent is shown in blue. And what you notice, so these are multiple individuals, multiple individuals, multiple individuals. 
And what you notice is there's separation on the tree. Okay? That means that, um, that red mice have bacula that are more similar to other red mice than they are to blue mice. Okay? That's it. The other thing is that, and this is, so this is kind of a, a lie. <laughs> these aren't all independent individuals. A lot of these are the same exact baculum taken out of the machine, repacked, rescanned, reanalyzed. And we do that again and again and again and again so that we know that our methods are solid, that we know we have repeatability. So like where you see two, two Bs there, like right on top of each other, those are really replicates of the same exact um, baculum. So that's good. Okay, so, um, um, so, so far we have separation of parental strains and we have high repeatability. The other thing is you notice there's a B1 and a B2. These are the same genotype of mouse um, one of which was grown in my lab, and one of which we ordered from the Jackson Labs. Very different life cycle, like every, or everything's different. Food's different. And we did that to kind of get a grasp for the environmental noise. And you don't see much. I mean, I would argue you don't see any. So environmental noise would come out as like a little subtree in the reds, where like all the B2s were together and all the B1s together. That would make us nervous, okay? But we don't see that. Okay, so we went ahead and made an F1. That's what these two guys here are. This is not a recombinant inbred panel. That's why we only made two of them, just to get a sort of idea of this. And that's very exciting. Why is that exciting? Because we like mixed the genomes of these two parents and we got something intermediate. There's something very important there called additivity. Okay, if you have additivity, thumbs up on quantitative genetics. We can do that, okay? If you don't have additivity, you got to do something else. How many genes are involved? It's a trick question. George? <laughs> That's the correct answer. But you know it's not zero, right? It's not zero genes. You just don't know how many. Okay? It could be one, it could be a thousand, it could be all of them at this point. So what did we do? So we looked at, we started to accumulate reals, these recombinant inbred lines. And, um, and so I'll just show you one. So this is recombinant inbred line 34, six, individ six different individuals. This is not the same baculum rescanned. And that's also very nice. So this is, a, this is a genotype that's very different from this F1. It's 50% 50, 50 red, 50% blue, but it's not heterozygous, and it's, it definitely contains different 50% than that, right? And that line also falls intermediate. This is very, very exciting and cool. And it doesn't really cluster with that F1. How many genes are involved, George? Wow, it's a hit. It is. More than one at this point, OK? Without this, we know it's more than zero. With it, we know it's more than one, unless there's some weird, complicated stuff going on, which there could be. I like, you know what? I like your answer. We just, we just don't know. Let's stick with that. OK. I'm going to throw on the, um, I'm going to throw on the images of these typical, so there's four kind of groups here. These are their typical bacula. That's, Mr. Curvy, and um, that's heavy, whatever. And, and what's super cool is you can, like this one is sort of half curvy. It looks like it's kinked. It looks like I, I cut off the image. I didn't. That's really what it looks like. It looks seriously like it's kinked. So it's kind of half curvy. That's awesome, right? Because again, you don't want some method, you don't want to develop some method that doesn't, you know, kind of jibe with what your eyeballs see. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a bunch of reels, and I'm going to walk you through this slide slowly. And um, from now on, we're going to really talk about two phenotypes. One is size and one is shape. So the size is just that volume measurement that I, that, that I talked to you about. So it's the area of those rectangles multiplied by the interrectangle distances. Actually, I think it's the cube root of that or something, but who cares? Okay. All the rills are shown in gray, and the two parents are shown in red and blue. Okay, So let's just talk about this one, because it's sort of easy at the moment. Um, so what we see here is, is pretty good, actually. So the parents are here and here. In many of the rills, there's 48 of them, I think, in this image. Many of them are intermediate. You want intermediate when you're doing uh, quantitative genetics, because that tells you the variance is additive. There are, however, a bunch that fall outside the parental ranges. 
Okay? These are their error bars. You probably can't see them. But there are probably some that are significantly outside the parental range. And so that's also somewhat interesting. It suggests that either there's epistasis going on, so there's more than one gene involved, and they interact with each other in non-additive ways. Or it could just be that um, you know, there's like a low allele in red and a low allele in blue, and some of these rills inherited both of those low alleles. Okay? So that would be like transgressive uh, phenotype. Okay, so now let's talk about the shape analysis. So there's a lot of, a, a lot of machinery involved here. So what we did is we took those P, that PCA analysis, that little Christmas tree baculum, and we pulled out all of the high loading rectangles. And then we did a linear discriminant analysis. So a linear discriminant analysis is exactly a PCA except you tell the computer what the sample IDs are. So PCA, the computer is blind to the samples. In an LDA, the computer knows, and it knows what you want to do. You are telling the computer to separate maximally these groups. In this case, I fed the computer only two strains, only these two parental strains. It was blind to all this gray stuff. And I told the computer to separate those two strains in the maximum possible way. So it's very similar to PCA analysis. Instead of PC1, we get LD1. With two groups, there's a single LD. It's LD1. It's just a novel combination of all those rectangles. It's the same principle, though, as a PCA. OK. But again, and I stress, I just did that with the two parental strains. So it's totally blind to all this gray stuff. Then I, threw, then I just projected all the gray lines into the space defined by LD1. And this is really remarkable. So even though all of these gray bars are, you know, many of them are falling in between these two um, LD1 scores, okay? So th you can have negative LD1 scores, by the way. Um, a lot of them fall intermediate, even though the computer was completely blind to them. So this is really encouraging. This, the bottom line here is that the shape variance that we see is also looks largely additive. Okay? There are a bunch that fall outside of the parental range. Those pr though probably only like a few up here are significantly outside. And again, that could be epistasis or some kind of transgressive stuff. Okay. Another great resource, right? So not only do we have to develop all those rills for 30 years, we also have to genotype them. That's also already done. So I can also parasitize that. I can just download this file. Here's like BXD93. Uh, BXD is the um, replace those letters with real. OK, so it's real 93. These are their genotypes at all of these markers. There's 4,000 of them. Done. I'm done with my big genotyping project that would normally take an, uh, a year, right? So you can see recombination here. So like this real here has a big chunk of D chromosome and then big chunk of B chromosome. That's like the blue and the red that I was showing you. So again, we're just asking if certain uh, variants in the size or shape analyses are correlated to your alleles here. OK. So here's the answer, at least for the QTL. So again, we've got size on the top. We've got shape on the bottom. Um, this isn't coming out great, but there are little bands of gray that are separating chromosomes. This is like chromosome 1, 2, 3, 4, blah, 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 blah. And these are the LOD scores, uh, the negative LOD scores that are associated um, that, that assess the hypothesis that there is no QTL there. Okay? So if you're high on that y-axis, you're rejecting that hypothesis. And this red line here is a significance threshold determined from per permutations. Okay, so for size, most of the genome is not, does not seem to be correlated um, with the size of the baculum. There is a very significant peak here on chromosome 1. For shape, we see that same peak. This is almost exactly the same peak as that peak. Okay? This is very interesting. This suggests that size and shape might have a common genetic basis. It didn't need to be that way. Okay? Um, and then we get, this other, uh, we, we get this other very significant peak on chromosome 8. So chromosome 8 is totally like, not at all coming up in size. So this is saying maybe there are some other genetic factors that affect shape independently from, from size. Okay. Yippee. Are we done? 
So the big question is like, what now, right? Like, um, we've done the simulations. There are probably many more QTL for us to find. The fact that we find those QTL is, in fact, a statistical miracle. It really means that there are probably strong effect alleles under there that are explaining a lot of the variance. But we wanted to take this further because at this point, you know, these are peaks. And you know, there are lots of genes under here. So tens to hundreds of genes under here. How do you pick out the one um, that's responsible for the phenotype you're interested in? Or even if it is a gene, maybe it's some non-coding thing. So th the next experiment I'm going to tell you about is super, super preliminary and, and uh, really not well designed at all. That's OK. We just want to, we're really thinking of this as a hypothesis generation tool at the moment. OK. So we're going to combine our QTL with RNA-seq data. Okay? And here's our experimental male. And he's smiling, okay, but he's red because he's very nervous for what, what's about to happen. Okay? So I know, it's sad. No animals were harmed during this talk. Okay? <laughs> during this talk. I didn't harm any animals during this talk. OK. We, we take this stuff seriously. I shouldn't joke about it. And, uh, so we are, you know, yes, let's just leave it there. OK, how do I put it? We cut off their wieners, OK? We cut off their wieners when they were about five weeks old. We know from some developmental stuff that we did that this is the time when the early cartilage that's in there is becoming ossified. So there's our wiener. We ground it up. We got all its RNA out, and we threw it on an Illumina machine. We did this for about 10 males, all wieners pooled, aluminum machine, 39 million reads or something like that, in case you care. Um, so everything's very pooled. You notice we only have one parent, right? So we can't talk about differential expression here. The only thing we're trying to do at the moment is generate a list of genes that are highly expressed at this critical developmental moment when the baculum becomes ossified. That's all we're trying to do, OK? So, um, so we get a big gene list. These are great, wonderful. And then we're going to combine it, or you know, we're going to link it to the QTL stuff. So the, the game here, which is obviously incomplete, because we don't even have the other parental strain with, for RNA-seq, but the game here is to say, OK, I've got evidence that something here affects um, size or shape of a baculum. If I also know that it's highly expressed during this critical developmental point, I'm going to really think seriously about those being candidate genes. OK? That's it. Now, um, I'm going to do this a little out of order, because I realize I should have put this slide again. So pretend I didn't just make you all car sick. Um, for, for this QTL on chromosome 1, we don't find any highly expressed genes at that point. One explanation, maybe a little overly optimistic, is that the other parent is actually highly expressed there. And so we're actually finding the lowly expressed genes. We, we don't know. For QTL8, <coughs> we find three very highly expressed genes that are there. And, and, uh, and by highly expressed, if, if we take all the, you know, we detected 6,000 genes or something which, which had expression levels above zero, never mind what zero means. And if we take sort of the 90% uh, quantile and just call everything above that sort of high expression, again, it's kind of imperfect, but that's what we did. There's lots of ways to go back and even improve that, that part of the analysis. But for now, we've got three genes here under this QTL peak, okay? three genes that are highly expressed. Okay, now close your eyes again. I don't want to make you car sick. OK. Here are two of these genes. This is totally remarkable. Okay, so one is fro, fragilitis osseum. This is a disease that actually segregates in humans, and they have very brittle bones that break easily. This has phenotype. This has a func known function in bone morphogenesis. Here's uh, CFR, cysteine-rich fibroblast growth factor receptor. Also has bone morphogenesis phenotypes. Okay, we know some pathways involved here. We know some morphologies. So here's like you know a normal mouse hind limb. This is the this is a fro fro knockout. Okay, so it's got like really you know squished up thin bones. Look, that's a curvy baculum. Can't you see it? Right. 
So that was a joke. <laughs> okay, here's like a close-up of their bones. Okay, so all that black stuff is, is ossification. This is the bones of this fro-fro knockout. There's like seriously reduced ossification. Okay. I have no idea if these are the genes that are responsible for variation in baculum size and shape. But I can't be that wrong, right? I mean, what, are the, what is the likelihood of pulling out two genes that are involved in bone morphogenesis that are under a QTL explaining size and shape variance? By the way, there's only like 40 or so genes in the mouse genome known to have bone morphogenesis phenotypes. Very few of them with any phenotypes this dramatic. Okay, so for now, let's call it candidate genes. Okay, in my grand vision, uh, you know, eventually we'll be able to modify the expression of these genes in developing mouse penises and actually manipulate the size and the shape of the baculum and then ask what happens to, its, to that male reproductive, that male's reproductive fitness. Okay. So, is there a genetic basis? I, you know, there's definitely a genetic basis. We can say that. So we can do some fancier stats too. And there's, you know, the per, your, your strain designation explains a huge amount of the variance in size and phenotype, i.e., there's a genetic basis to the variance. Whether or not we found anything involved in the exact variance, we can, t we can argue about. But at the moment, I would say, yes, we've identified two candidate genes. And obviously, there's going to be more down the road. Again, we're under, underpowered at the moment. But OK. So who, who cares about all this stuff? I, I do, but that doesn't mean you have to. Actually, you should. Um, so one of the reasons is you know, all those fundamental patterns of evolution of morphological divergence that I talked about, there are very few examples where we actually know the genetic basis of that variation. They're, they're very, very few. And so I would argue that this is the kind of research that we need to do to provide a genetic link to some of these fundamental patterns. OK, and then you know, the big pie in the sky, which is what I just said, is that knowledge of the genetic basis of all this variation might help us manipulate its development in the future. So the future is just to add more rills. Okay, and then another big one. So the, the rill that I told you about is just one of like a dozen in the mouse community. And so another really big one is to look at independent rills. We have a pre-proposal in to suggest that is a good idea. If any of you are reviewing it, you should put excellent down. Um, so there we'd be able to ask if in using independent genetics, are we getting the same hits? Are there different genetic bases? Are there different ways you can get a curvy baculum, right? And then another big one, so I, I could have thrown some of these slides in, but we want to understand uh, the development of the baculum more. And we want to understand if it's affected by sexual activity. So in some initial data that we took, we took some males, and we housed them alone. And we took their full brothers, and we housed them with a female. And we looked at them at 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 weeks old. And wouldn't you know, now this is an N of like five, okay? but wouldn't you know that the, the shape actually differs between those two? And that's a very interesting thing, because that suggests there might be some feedback mechanism to a baculum's development. And I think that's very exciting. OK, I have no idea why this is on here. These are a bunch of raccoons. <laughs> also, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. Um, I would just like to thank the following um, people and, and sources of funding. And thank you all. It's been really a pleasure to come talk to you. you. Now I'm supposed to repeat the question, so. Yes. OK, so the question is, I mentioned that there's gains and losses of the baculum. And believe it or not, uh, throughout mammalian evolution. So if you ask a mammal mammologist, you know, exact, I'm not a real mammologist, by the way. I'm a poser. But if you ask, ask a real mammologist, have there been independent gains and losses of the baculum? They will do this. Yeah, of course. You know, because they're sort of working out the phylogenetic distribution of it. 
As far as I know, if you ask those same mammologists, is that, where is that published? It's not published. Okay, so we need to do a formal analysis to show that, but it probably most certainly is. So there are certain groups that um, don't have it. Per Perissodactyls don't have it. Cetaceans don't have it. Um, there are certain groups that have it. And then there are certain, like most rodents, I don't think there's any rodent that doesn't have a baculum. I could be wrong about that. Um, but then there's groups where it's both. So like primates are one. Bats are incredible. I was talking to one of your grad students about bats earlier. Or don't see you in here. Um, and about half the bat species have a baculum and about half of them don't. So we have to work it all out. And we've got like a data matrix of like a thousand species so far, um, which we'll probably, you know, we'll probably do that sometime. So yeah. Yes. So just, and then the baculum is a crazy variable, but if you're just thinking about, you know, do you have any intuitive feelings of whether there's any, at least any kind of social behavioral mating system type correlates of something that might get at some of the functions? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great question. And the question is, are there any correlates between mating system evolution and baculum morphology? You know, maybe, maybe very promiscuous species have very crazy bacula or something like that. And the, the simple answer is yes and no. So like sometimes people have seen it and some people, sometimes people haven't. So in rodents, um, if you just look, I mean, we were talking about this earlier, it's very hard to estimate what, the, what real sort of strength of sexual selection is, but if you look at testis size as a, as a proxy. Um, in rodents, long or big testes, and you, you get a long baculum. But in that same study, in fact, which was in uh, dogs, or, can it, or it was in uh, felids, so it was in cats, um, there's no correlation whatsoever. So sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. Again, all of this is like length stuff, right? So we're really losing a lot of information. Um, so I don't know if that answered your question or just gave you more, but um, basically, you know, yes and no. <laughs> yeah. So what about the um, female reproductive uh, morphology? Very good question. So the question was about how, what about the female morphology? So that's something incredibly wide open in, in terms of scientific questions. So where you see this stuff more often than anything I've talked about is in insects because it's easier to study female reproductive tracts because they're chitinous and they're, they're hard and female reproductive tracts in mammals are soft tissue. It's very difficult to get at. Um, I will tell you that um, females have a baculum. It's not called a baculum, it's called a bobellum. So it's, it's ossification in the clitoris. Clitoris is essentially a penis, right? It's developmentally the same stuff. Um, and there is a, a correlation, I mean, there, there sort of is uh, a correlation there. So like walruses, I should have brought a walrus baculum. It's about this big, right? It's the biggest, ab on absolute sense, is the biggest baculum in the animal kingdom. The thing weighs about eight pounds. It's remarkable. And the, and the os, or the, um, the bobellum is also gigantic, right? So there is some kind of, but wh what does that mean, right? There's those just like linked developmental constraints. So there's like some selection going on in males which drags the genes through that causes ossification there, or is there like some functional impact there? I, I, I would hope that you know, the genes involved in baculum morphology also could be manipulated to study like, um, I keep trying to say os clitoris, but it's called the bobellum. So um, at the moment, we don't really know. I guess I'm wondering more if, there, if there's an arms race hypothesis mm -hmm. Yeah. So you, you definitely see evidence of that in insects. So like if I were just to cruise back here, um, like uh, this, this reminds me of a seed beetle penis. Okay. So a seed beetle has a very, it looks like a mace with all these spikes coming out. And this is probably surely linked up with sexual conflict. So males are actually trying to physically induce damage to females so that they won't remate. That's good for the male, bad for the female. And in the female's reproductive tract, they've evolved these amazing regions of heavy, heavy sclerotinization to try to sort of, I don't know, uh, you know, to tolerate that damage and then say, like, you know, I'm going to go remate anyhow, right? So you definitely see examples of this in insects, but it's just much harder to get at in, in, uh, in mammals. Like, you know, is this thing, I mean, is this evolved to induce damage to the female reproductive tract? And if so, is, there's a, there's a squirrel, does a female squirrel have like, 
I don't know what's going on with their epithelium, right? You're, you're right on. We just, we're a long ways from understanding it. All three of you, all at once, go. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Whoever goes first. Uh, it was HP, which I can't remember what it stands for, but it's an immune system gene. No, no bone, bone morphology involved. Uh, something to do with uh, leukocyte counts. Yes? That's a good question. So is there a fitness difference between the two parental genotypes? And actually, uh, yes, the blue, the blue parent is much more difficult to maintain in the, strain, in, the, in the lab. They're much worse breeders. I have no idea if that has anything to do with bacula. Probably doesn't, but we don't know. Oh, we, like what the mechanism is of, so you talking about the two studies I showed you? The, the shapes that I showed you or the studies I showed you? The, these studies or, okay, this. What's the fitness difference between these? I have no idea. Zero. But I'm telling you, this is a blue parent here and this is a red parent and these are very poor breeders and these are very good breeders, which might have, which probably has nothing to do with bacula. But that's about all I can tell you. We have no idea. That's the whole point of all this, right? We want to understand what the fitness differences of these are. And to do that, we want to be able to manipulate the system. Yeah. Okay, so the question is about whether or not we've looked at wild mice. And wild mice are all over the place. And, and uh, they mostly look like this. Um, but again, there's so much. There's so much noise involved, non-repeatable genotypes, environmental noise through the roof, that we really want to tackle this in the lab at the moment. But yeah, there's other systems, I think, like the paramiscus stuff that we were talking about, where we could look at different populations that we know how long they've been separated. And I think that if, if you find differences there, I think that would be very interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. And it seems like there you would have this would be a great trait to try to differ between the species. And so when you're working with a hybrid, yeah. My gosh, there's so many things I want to tell you. Okay. So the question is about the, the choice of lab strain. And um, Patricia knows something that most of you don't, which is that these strains, so these were developed um, you know, 100 years ago. And it turns out that humans, because we're, we're dumb, okay, we, we actually like contaminated, it probably was on purpose, we actually contaminated their gene pools. And so, um, so th this, we would like to call this a, um, a mouse called Mus domesticus, okay? Um, but there is a little Mus musculus in this, in this genome. It's very, it's very small. I don't know what the current estimate is now. It's like eight, you might know better. It's like five to eight percent or something. A little more than that. Okay, um, this is D no, that's C57. This is DBA, and I don't D D I don't know. <laughs> What's is it same number for DBA? Yeah. Okay. So it's like they're 92 percent the right species. <laughs> so like if you talk to if you talk to people who do, you know, the collaborative cross right, is another yeah, real yeah. where they purposely the founders are different species. Right. You know, if you talk to those people, they sort of say like I, I don't care. You know, what do I care if if the phenotype is because of interspecific epistasis gone awry, right? I still found the gene involved. And um, I can't really argue with that, except that I like to think about the ecology of the animal. Exactly. So, exactly. you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, now, the other thing I was going to tell you was, oh, so we've looked at mus musculus spacula. In fact, we've looked at mus spreadus spacula. So mus musculus and mus domesticus are, you know, some people don't even call them species because they're very, very closely related. Mus musculus looks like a mus domesticus baculum. We can't separate them, which is weird telling, after I told you they evolve so rapidly. And then if I look at mus spreadus, which is, um, 
I don't know, two to three million years ago, um, also doesn't look that, that different. So there's not like clear groups falling out. So I guess that's an argument to say even the 8% probably doesn't make much difference. But I mean, I'm not going to make reels all over again. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. <laughs> so I think there is one. Okay, thanks.